A Summary and Interpretation of 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson Narrated and Interpreted by Alexander Sandalis Rule 10. Be precise in your speech. There's a story for children named There's No Such Thing as a Dragon by Jack Kent. It tells the story of a child named Billy Bixby who spies on a dragon sitting on his bed one morning. It's about the size of a house cat and friendly. He tells his mother about it, but she tells him that there's no such thing as a dragon. So it starts to grow. It eats all of Billy's pancakes. Soon it fills the whole house. Mum tries to vacuum, but she has to go in and out of the house through the windows because the dragon is everywhere. It takes her forever. Then the dragon runs off with the house. Billy's dad comes home and there's just an empty space where he used to live. The mailman tells him where the house went. He chases after it climbs up the dragon's head, and now sprawling out into the street, finally rejoins his wife and son. Mum still insists that the dragon does not exist, but Billy, who's pretty much had it by now, insists there is a dragon, Mum. Instantly, it starts to shrink. Soon, it's cat-sized again. Everyone agrees that the dragon of, of that size, one, exists, and two, are much preferable to their gigantic counterparts. Mum, eyes reluctantly opened by this point, asks somewhat plaintively why it had to get so big. Billy quietly suggests, maybe it wanted to be noticed. The moral of this story is the consequence of sweeping things under the rug. The moral of this story is the consequence of not facing the accumulated chaos and the disorder that it can manifest into. Maybe this is the moral of many stories. Chaos emerges in a household bit by bit. Mutual unhappiness and resentment pile up. Everything untidy is swept under the rug where the dragon feasts on the crumbs. The dragon is the lie. The dragon is the sin of omission. But no one says anything. As the shared society and negotiated order of the household reveals itself as inadequate, or disintegrates in the face of unexpected and threatening. Everybody whistles in the dark instead. Communication would require admission of terrible emotions, resentment, terror, loneliness, despair, jealousy, frustration, hatred, boredom. Moment by moment, it's easier, it's easier to keep the peace. It's easy to hide all these emotions and not face them. It's easy to do what Billy Bixby's mum did and ignore the problem. Uh, fall into naivete or to plain ignorance of the fact that you have problems, you have serious problems that you need to deal with, but it's easier for you to run away from them and ignore them. But then the dragon grows all the more bigger and one day it bursts forth in a form that no one can ignore. It lifts the very household from its foundations and then what does that mean? Well, it could be an affair for you, it could be illness for another person, or it could be a decades-long custody dispute. This is what the dragon can grow into. It can grow into the most challenging problems and issues that the average human faces. Every one of the 300,000 unrevealed issues which have been lied about, avoided, rationalized away, hidden like an army of skeletons in some great horrific closet, burst forth like Noah's flood, drowning everything. But guess what? There's no ark. Why? Because no one built one. Even though everyone felt the storm gathering. Hmm. Don't ever underestimate the destructive power of sins of omission. Remembering a sin of omission, like previously discussed in previous rules. Instead of a sin of commission, which is a voluntary act. Further towards higher good, or further down towards further evil and lies. However, a sin of omission is more insidious. Or more cunning, rather. It's not as obvious. It's being quiet when you should speak up about the little things that bother you about maybe your partner maybe a best friend maybe about yourself the issues you ignore them you don't speak about them you tell lies 
or you don't tell the truth. These are sins of omission. And maybe the demolished couple could have had a conversation or two or 200 about their sex lives. Maybe the physical intimacy they undoubtedly shared should have been matched as it often is not by a corresponding psychological intimacy. All right, so the outcome of hiding the dragon ends up manifesting itself often in tumultuous, destructive relationships. And they often are, and they become, with people that we care about, with people that we aim to spend most of our lives with, or the rest of our lives with. Uh, whether this is in a marriage or a long-term relationship, most people have experienced some type of romantic relationship at some point in their life. So this is the context we're discussing with. It's something that almost everybody can relate to. And so if you can relate to it, it can help ingrain these ideas a little deeper. So maybe the demolished couple could have precisely and spe uh, specified their desired manner of being. Maybe in that manner, they could have jointly prevented the waters of chaos from springing uncontrollably forth and drowning them. And this can manifest itself in infidel infidelity, in physical and emotional abuse. This can be avoided if we precisely and specifically articulate what we need to be desired in of ourselves and of the other person. If we communicate honestly and openly and don't hide the dragon under at the end of the bed. Maybe they could have done that instead of saying in an agreeable, lazy, cowardly way, it's okay, it's not worth fighting about. I'm okay, I'm fine. There is little in a marriage that is so little that is not worth fighting about. You're stuck in a marriage like the two proverbial cats in a barrel, bound by the oath that lasts in the theory until one or both of you die. That oath is there to make you take the damn situation seriously. Do you really want to want the same petty annoyance tormenting you every single day of your marriage for the decades of its existence? It's not just about marriage. It's not just about a couple. Do you really want the petty same annoyance within you, tormenting you for the rest of your life? And I think he makes Peterson makes such a important point. Whether you end up getting married, a lot of people watching this, if not already, are going to be, if not already, married. Right? When you take those vows, even if you don't get married, there will, there will be some type of uh, ritual that we commit to ourselves and to our partner to symbolize commitment, honesty, and a whole bunch of other characteristics that we want our relationship to be. Right? We bound ourselves by oath. Let's take it more seriously. It's okay. It's not worth fighting about. Is the easy answer. It's running away from the problem. Now look, practically speaking, do you sometimes have to just step away and say, it's okay, another day. Well, you do that tomorrow. You don't let that be ignored. You make sure you put that seed in the back of your mind and you deal with that, that problem, that seed. Otherwise, it could grow into something poisonous instead of something fruitful. Or you might say, oh, I could put up with it. It's something small. Maybe you should put up with it. You're no paragon of genuine tolerance. And maybe if you brought up how your partner's giddy laugh is beginning to sound like nails on blackboard, he or she would tell you quite properly to go to hell. And maybe the fault is with you. It usually is. And you should grow up, get yourself together and keep quiet. Under such circumstances, there is nothing but a fight. A fight with peace as the goal. That will reveal the truth. But you remain silent and you convince yourself it's because you are a good, peace-loving, patient person. And nothing could be further from the truth. You are a coward, in fact justifying yourself as a paragon of civility 
some type virtue, almost virtue signaling to yourself. I'm patient. I'm, I'm gonna be the better man and woman. I'm not gonna fight. Hm. I don't have to fight. I just have to fight for each other, for what is worthwhile, for common peace within yourself and within the people you care about, the relationships you develop. And so you convince yourself you're this patient paragon of civility, this loving, peace, peaceful person that never wants to fight. But the monster under the rug then gains a few pounds. You never talked about it. You walked away from it. And so it grows. And you've committed a sin of omission. Perhaps addressing that problem and solving that problem would be worth two months of pure misery just telling each other the truth. Not with the intent to destroy or attain victory because that's not truth, that's just an all-out war. The goal of conversation and dialogue and even argument is not to win or to lose. You don't want to be a winner because then guess what? You're living with a loser and no one wants to live with the loser no one wants to feel like a loser. And no one finds a perfect match, this ideal person, that the need for continued attention and work vanishes. And besides, if you found this perfect person, this soulmate, and maybe soulmate isn't the right word, maybe you, maybe perfect person and soulmate are different things. But if you, even if you found this perfect person, he or she would run away from you so quickly, from the ever so imperfect you in a justifiable horror. In truth, what you need, what you deserve, after all, is someone, is, is someone exactly as imperfect as you. Maybe we do. Maybe the husband who betrayed his wife was appallingly immature and selfish. Maybe that selfishness got the upper hand. Maybe she did not oppose this tendency with enough force and vigor. Everything clarified and articulated becomes visible. Maybe neither the wife nor husband wish to see or understand. Maybe they left things purposefully in the fog. Maybe they generated the fog to hide what they did not want to see. Right? This is sin of omission. Ignoring. Such a poisonous, insidious thing to do. But it's, it's tempting. Because it's uncomfortable to face your problems. And so people don't do it. Here's the terrible truth. Every voluntary, unprocessed, and uncomprehended and ignored reason for marital failure will compound and conspire and will then plague that betrayed and self-betrayed woman for the rest of her life. The same goes for her husband. All she, he, they, or we must do to ensure such an outcome is nothing. So, you want to guarantee torment for yourself and marital failure? Don't notice, don't react, don't attend, don't discuss, don't consider, don't work for peace, don't take responsibility, don't confront the chaos and turn it into order, just wait for the chaos to rise up and engulf you instead. Why avoid when avoidance necessarily and inevitably poisons the future? Because the possibility of a monster lurks underneath all the disagreements and errors. Maybe the fight you are having or not having with your wife or husband signifies the beginning of the end of your relationship. Maybe your relationship is ending because you are a bad person. So you get it, right? You can understand why people don't want to face that. Why they don't want to face what hides underneath the rug. The monster that hides underneath, that looks underneath the, 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 the rug. Because that's all the, that's all the agreements, disagreements, insecurities, the things that bother you. And if you go there... Is that going to be the end? Is that going to be the beginning of the end? Is this, is my relationship going to end? Am I going to st Am I going to cause our own demise because I want because I dared peek under the rug? So you get it. It's scary, right? But you have to face that anyway. You got. It's either going to end one or two ways. You're either going to live a miserable existence well it won't start miserable it'll eventually get miserable you'll eventually get to a point of misery because you didn't have the courage to look under or you have the courage to look under and either work out your problems or you realize i can't work my problems out we can't work our problems out we are not 
compatible or meant to be or whatever whatever phrase you want to use we're not this time in our lives at our versions of ourselves we cannot be with each other and so we must move on and that that's the scary thing maybe your relationship is any because you're a bad person it's likely at least in part isn't it having the argument necessary to solve a real problem therefore necessitates willingness to confront two forms of miserable and dangerous potential simultaneously chaos and the potential fragility of the relationship of all relationships of life itself that is chaos and hell the fact that you and your partner could each be the person bad enough to ruin everything with your laziness and spite there's every motivation to avoid but it doesn't help why remain vague when it renders life stagnant and murky well if you don't know who you are and you can hide in doubt maybe you're not a bad careless worthless person ignorance is bliss this is where this comes from who knows not you because you're ignorant particularly if you refuse to think about it and you have every reason not to but not thinking about something you don't want to know about doesn't make it go away not thinking about something you don't want to know doesn't make it go away man not thinking about something you don't want to know doesn't make it go away so knowing that screw it just face it anyway the reality is going to be the reality you might as well bring your outward reality into your inner consciousness into what what you perceive connect the two bridge order and chaos and find some type of harmony within yourself why refuse to investigate when knowledge of reality enables mastery of reality you may say isn't it better under such conditions of truly something rotten and hellish being there to live in willful blindness and enjoy the bliss of ignorance? Well, not if the monster is real. Do you truly think it is a good idea to retreat, to abandon the possibility of arming yourself against the rising sea of troubles and to thereby diminish yourself in your own eyes? Do you truly think it is wise to let the catastrophe grow in the shadows while you shrink and decrease and become ever more afraid? Isn't it better to prepare, to sharpen your sword, to peer into the darkness? In fact, to be courageous and then to face the lion in its den and maybe you'll get hurt. Probably you'll get hurt. You'll get hurt. And life after all is suffering, but maybe the wound won't be fatal. If you wait instead until what you are refusing to investigate comes knocking at your door, things will certainly not go so well for you. What you least want will inevitably happen and when you are least prepared, what you least want to encounter will make itself manifest when you're weakest and it is strongest and you will be defeated. And so this is the utility for facing your suffering, facing the dragon underneath the rug, facing the lion in the den, facing your demons and your fears, because they're coming anyway. Everybody you know is gonna die. Why did I just say that? Seems unrelated. Maybe? It's not at all. In fact, that's what's going to come a-knocking. What you least want to inevitably happen. We're not just talking about relationships. We're talking about every pain in life is going to come. Whether you face it or not, it's the nature of the human experience. So what are you going to do to prepare for it? What are you going to do to prepare for the fact that everybody you care for and know is going to die. A lot of them by unfortunate illness and extended suffering. What are you going to do to prepare for that? Mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. What are you going to do? Are you going to ignore it? And every time someone says that, you get really uncomfortable and squirmy and say, don't talk about that. I don't want to hear that. That makes me really uncomfortable. 
It makes me emotional. Okay. What's going to happen? And when it does, because you hit that under the rug, you're not going to be prepared. Are you ever prepared for death? I don't know. But you can sharpen your sword. You can be more prepared. Mentally. So then, when you have to attend, when your father and mother dies, and you're attending their funeral, you can be... a symbol of strength and hope. You can be a shield for those that never faced the lion in the den, that never faced the dragon, the ones that were too uncomfortable to do it, too scared. You can help be a shield for them in one of the most darkest, difficult times of their life. And, you, and that's where you'll find some meaning and fulfillment. But why do people refuse to specify their problems and talk about these things when specifying the problem would enable its solution? Well, because to specify the problem is to admit that it exists. And half the people don't want to admit that their problems exist. Because to specify the problem is to allow yourself to know what you want, say from a friend or lover, and then you will know precisely and cleanly when you don't get it. And that will hurt sharply and specifically, but you will learn something from that and use what you learn in the future. And the alternative is that the, that single sharp pain is the dull ache of continued hopelessness and vague failure and the sense that time, precious time, is slipping by. What if she who has been betrayed, now driven by desperation, is now determined to face all the incoherence of past, present, and future? What if she decided to sort through the mess, even though she has been avoiding doing so until now, and it is all the weaker and more confused for, for it? Perhaps the effort would nearly kill her, but she is now on a path worse than death, in any case. To re-emerge, to escape, to be reborn, she must thoughtfully articulate the reality she comfortably but dangerously left hidden behind the veil of ignorance and the presence of peace. She must separate the particular details of her catastrophe from the intolerable general condition of being in a world where everything has fallen apart. Everything. That's far too much. How can we deal with everything? It was specific things that fell apart. Not everything. Identifiable beliefs failed. Particular actions were false and inauthentic. What were they? How can they be fixed now? How can she be better in the future? She will never return to the dry land if she refuses or is unable to figure it all out. She can put the world back together by some precision of thought, some precision of speech, some reliance of her own word, some reliance on the word. One way we can practically do this to ourselves is to detach ourselves from media, from stimulus, from consumption. Using times like Times, I don't even want to call it meditation. Times when you're just alone by yourself. Using times alone by yourself, uh, stepping away from any type of consumption, any type of technology, and just being here. The space, through that, you give yourself space. Naturally, space is created mentally. And you can begin to problem solve. Your brain, your mind begins to problem solve for you. You begin to reflect. You begin to think. Huh. You begin to separate emotion from reflection. Emotion from thought. They separate now. and you, you from Because you've given yourself some space away from everything. Just to be alone. So if you're wondering, how can I put myself back together? How can I figure out what went wrong? I believe we need to give ourselves space mentally and step away from it all and talk to ourselves and, and, and go through physical voluntary suffering, like challenging tasks that make us look inward of ourselves 
what if you can avoid all this or avoid most of it? What if you or she had communicated your or her unhappiness with the decline of her romantic life right when it started to decline? What if you nipped it in the bud? Precisely exactly when that decline first bothered her. Or if it didn't bother her, what she had instead communicated the fact it didn't bother her as much as it perhaps should have. What if she had clearly and carefully confronted the fact of her husband's contempt for her household efforts? Would she have discovered her resentment of her father and society itself and the consequent damnation and contamination of her relationship? What if she had fixed all that? How much stronger would she then have become? How much less likely to avoid facing up to difficulties and consequence? How might she have then served herself, her family, and the world? What if she had continually and honestly risked conflict in the present in the service of longer term truth and presence? What if you risk conflict now to, to create a long term peace? You do what's uncomfortable now, the thing that bothers you now about the person don't react out of emotion, you respond out of logic and rationale and say, hey, this is how I'm feeling. <sighs> I know it may seem insensitive or even disrespectful, but I want to talk about it and figure out why I'm feeling this and I want to see how you feel about it. What if we had more of that dialogue? What if she had treated the micro collapses of her marriage as evidence of an underlying instability eminently worthy of attention instead of ignoring them, putting up with them or smiling through them in such a nice, agreeable manner. Maybe she would be different and her husband different too. Maybe they would still be married formally and in spirit. Maybe they would both be much younger physically and mentally than they are now. Maybe her house would have been founded more on rock and less on sand. A lot of people are forming the foundations of their relationships, their psyches and their... Uh, uh, on very soft, unstable foundations. Because every time you, you don't face one of these issues, you turn concrete and you soften it further and further. You put more cracks in the concrete. When things fall apart and chaos re-emerges, we can give structure to it and re-establish order through our speech. If we speak carefully and precisely, we can sort things out and put them in their proper place and set a new goal and navigate to it. Often communally, if we negotiate, if we reach consensus, if we speak carelessly and imprecisely, however, things remain vague. Things remain unsolved. The destination remains unproclaimed. The fog of uncertainty does not lift and there is no negotiating through the world. I wrote a note here saying this is one of the most important lessons in this book. That's what I felt at the moment. So we take it back to the title of this rule. What is this about? Be precise in your speech. Being precise in your speech isn't just about the superficial uh, ability to articulate the micro, to articulate the phrases, to do what I'm doing now, to, to have the verbal warfare or the verbal dialogue with yourself and with other people. It's not just about being able to be clever and articulate with intelligence and, and tact and wit. It's simply just about speaking with the intent to figure things out. I don't even think it's just about speaking precisely. It's about speaking at all. Because a lot of times since vomission, they're not speaking at all. It's being quiet, it's lying. So in fact, be precise in your speech. Not just that, but speak, speak up and be precise in your speech. When you identify a problem, whether that's within a relationship or with anybody, that the problem needs to be identified as close to the time of its emergence as possible. If we think back to classical conditioning and just basic behavioral psychology and behavioral science, it's very evident that we want the response to the stimulus to be as close as possible to create some type of associative conditioning to even just keep them, keep them as close together as possible if you had if you see a problem it's not always wise to just sit on it 
Because once you distance yourself from your problem, it's not so much that you've distanced yourself. It's that the other person doesn't know you have a problem until you articulate it. So for them, it's just them being. For them, it's just them acting out their own being in life. So there's gonna, they're not going to always remember what you precisely had a problem with unless, if you, if you wait, if you wait days or weeks or months on end. So if you could find a way to admit and identify and speak about the problem as close as reasonably and practically possible to the actual behavior, your likelihood of addressing what you need to address theoretically dramatically improves. Precision specifies when something terrible happens, it is precision that separates the unique terrible thing that has actually happened from all the other equally terrible things that might have happened, but did not. If you wake up in pain, you might be dying. You might be dying slowly and terribly from one of the diverse number of painful, horrible diseases. If you refuse to tell your doctor about your pain, then what you have is unspecified. It could be any of those diseases and it certainly since you have avoided the diagnostic conversation, the act of articulation is something unspeakable. But if you talk to your doctor, all those terrible possible diseases will collapse with luck into just one terrible or not so terrible disease, or even into nothing. Then you can laugh at your previous fears, and if something really is wrong, well, you're prepared. Precision may leave the tragedy intact, but it chases away the ghouls and demons. The doctor symbolizes every person and problem you have a relationship every person you have a relationship with that's what this the doctor symbolizes here speak to the doctor speak to the friend speak to the person life is essentially about people right that's what this rule is very heavily focused on just like if you refuse to tell your doctor about pain and and symptoms that you're experiencing well You'll never know when I'd be able to identify what the precise problem is with you. The same way if you never speak up to that friend, that partner, that spouse about the problem that you're feeling, the symptoms you're feeling, the pain you're feeling, then you're never going to get to the cause of it. You're never going to get to the root of it, are you? And we know something is out there in the woods, right? We know something. The woods is the unknown. The woods is what's scary. But often it's only a squirrel. It's something that's not so harm not so harmful. But if you refuse to look, however, then it's a dragon. Because that's what it grows into. And you're no knight. You're a mouse confronting a lion, a rabbit paralyzed by the gaze of a wolf. But you can act like a lion. You can embody the persona, the characteristics of the lion, of the courageous knight warrior. And I, I'm not saying it's always a squirrel. Often it's something tru truly terrible, but even what is terrible in actuality often pales in significance compared to what is terrible in imagination. Our imagination is powerful. Our ability to conjure up the worst possible scenarios is quite incredible. Uh, so, if you just articulate your problems and you communicate them to the individual you need to communicate them to, they often shrink in size because what you imagined, think about all the times you imagined something bad and you didn't know what was going to happen. You were uncertain, you are a bit scared, you are a bit anxious. And you think back, your imagination 99 times out of 100 is almost always worse than the actual reality. In fact, it's like half the reality. It's like half the imagination that you thought that was the problem. So much smaller than you, we thought. And often what cannot be confronted because of its horror in imagination can in fact be confronted when reduced to its still admittedly terrible actuality. If you shirk the responsibility of confronting the unexpected, even when it appears in manageable doses, reality itself will become unsustainably disorganized and chaotic. Then it will grow bigger and swallow all order, all sense, and all predictability. Ignored reality transforms itself into the great goddess of chaos, the great reptilian monster of the unknown. 
The great predatory beast against which mankind has struggled since the dawn of time. If the gap between pretense and reality goes unmentioned, it will widen. You will fall into it and the consequences will not be good. Ignored reality manifests itself in an abyss of confusion and suffering. Be careful with what you tell yourself and others about what you have done, what you are doing and where you are going. Search for the correct words. Take your time. Organize those words into the correct sentences and those sentences into the correct paragraphs. The past can be redeemed when re reduced by precise language to its essence. And this is one of the most... Uh, th this is something that Peterson has taught me. Rather, instead of speaking about it, he's just been it. He's just done it. When you observe incredible or orators like Peterson... You really learn to understand how careful some... It really, no, you know what it does? It highlights, it reveals within you how imprecise we are with our speech. When you see incredible orators like Peterson, like, like Churchill, speak. You quickly begin to realize, wow, I'm lazy with my words. I rush. I don't use pauses in sentences. I try to fill the space. I get awkward with pauses because it makes me feel uncomfortable. Can you welcome the pause? Can you invite it? Can you take your time? It's okay to not have an answer to a question. Can you be okay with that? Can that? Can you soften your ego enough to say, I don't know. To say, I need to think about that. I'm, I'm gonna answer that tomorrow. always rush into speech you rush into finding a quick answer finding a quick solution don't hide baby monsters under the carpet they will flourish they will grow large in the dark then when you least expect it they will jump out and devour you you will descend into intermediate confusing hell instead of ascending into heaven of virtue and clarity courageous and truthful words will render your reality simple pristine well defined and habitable if you identify things with careful attention and language you bring them forward as viable obedient objects detaching them from the underlying near universal interconnectedness you simplify them. You make them specific and useful and reduce their complexity. You make it imp you make it possible to live with them and use them without dying from the complexity with its, uh, with its attendant uncertainty and anxiety. If you leave things vague, then you'll never know what is the one thing and what is the other. Everything will bleed into everything else. This makes the world too complex to be managed. You have to consciously define the topic of conversation, particularly when it is difficult or it becomes about everything. And everything is too much. That is so frequently why couples cease communicating. Every argument degenerates into every problem that ever emerged in the past, every problem that exists now, and every terrible thing that is likely to happen in the future. No one can have a discussion about everything. Instead, you can say this exact precise thing. That is what is making me unhappy. That is what we're going to talk about. That's a problem we fall into. A cascade of problems end up turning into every problem. Can you step outside yourself just for a moment and say, Hey, I know I'm emotional. I know I'm feeling... I'm not feeling in control of myself right now, but I need to pause and step outside myself and just specify the one issue that I'm feeling it's tempting to let all the other ones cloud your judgment but that's exactly what they're doing clouding judgment this exact precise thing that is what you could deliver so that I will stop making your life and mine miserable but to do that you have to think what is wrong exactly what do I want exactly how do you find that you reflect you give yourself space you write you must speak speak forthrightly and call forth the habitable world from chaos you must be honest precise to do that. If you instead shrink away and hide, what you are hiding from will transform itself into the giant dragon that lurks under your bed and in your forest and in the dark recesses of your mind and it will devour you. You must determine where you have been in your life so that you can know where you are now. If you don't know where you are precisely, then you could be anywhere. Anywhere is too many places to be. And some of those places are very bad. You must determine where 
you have been in your life because otherwise you can't get to where you are going. You can't get from point A to B unless you are already at point A. And if you're just anywhere and things are everything and you're trying to solve everything, the chances you are at point A are very small indeed. And so how are you supposed to solve any problems if you're not even at the point to solve them because you don't even know where you are? You must determine where you're going in life because you cannot get there unless you move in that direction. Random wandering will not move you forward. It will instead disappoint and frustrate you and make you anxious and unhappy and hard to get along with. And then resentful and then ven vengeful. Say what you mean so that you can find out what you mean. Act out what you say so you can find out what happens. And pay attention. Note your errors. Articulate them. Strive to correct them. That is how you discover meaning in your life. That will protect you from the tragedy of your life. How could it be otherwise? Confront the chaos of being. Take aim against a sea of troubles. Specify your destination and chart your course. Admit to what you want. Tell those around you who you are. Narrow and gaze attentively and move forward forthrightly. Be precise in your speech.